Good evening, everyone. Ooh, I'm a principal, so I'm going to say it again. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the love. So I wish I could say that I had slides ready. I wish I could say that I would have stopped home and got dressed and not in my scholar's uniforms. But this is the life of a principal in New York City. Yeah, whoop, whoop. And, um, and maybe perhaps this is a good way of me sharing with you how my life has been since I've become a principal, about having to share a story so that people can imagine what the possibilities are as opposed to having awesome slides. So I'm going to give you um, two things that you can do so that after this, maybe you will follow up. One, you can Google my school, which is Mott Hall Bridges Academy. I'm going to say it again, Mott Hall Bridges Academy. Um, and I'm at the Lopez Effect. So that's my handle for social media. Um, so you can contact me and I respond. I don't really have an assistant. I am her. Um, so I opened a school in 2010 in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Anyone familiar with Brownsville? Okay, three, three, four people, great. Um, Brownsville, if you Google it, the description is violence, the description is gangs, the description would be poverty, often it's the poorest neighborhood. If you ask children in Brownsville, specifically my sixth graders, describe to me the place that you live. They will immediately say to you, it's a place where people get raped. It's a place where there are drug addicts. It's a place where you come to die and you don't live. That's my scholar's imagination. The average income is $11,000 simply because we have the highest number of housing developments, which are projects, in all of the United States. The average um, percentage of people who have a degree is at 32%. And so you think to yourself, if only 32% of people have a high school diploma, why would you even bother to open up a middle school? Well, I have a mantra that says, I opened a school to close a prison. Because at the end of the day, it is the fourth and seventh grade scores that determine how many prisons we built. And in New York State, 80% of the people who go to prison come from communities like Brownsville. So majority of my scholars may have an absentee father because he's either incarcerated or he's dead or they just never knew them. And so there's a cycle that happens because what's the best thing that ever happened to me? I would say meeting every single one of my scholars, right? And so the thing that I would remind you is this. There's a generation of individuals who have come through the New York City public school system in Brownsville. And unfortunately, we have failed them. We haven't provided them the resources. We haven't provided the adequate funding. We haven't given them the technology that they deserve. And so it's been my job to make sure our children get what they fundamentally deserve because prison should never be a child's option. So I created a STEM-focused school when I opened up Mount Hope Bridges Academy because as a kid, I really loved science. I loved technology, I loved engineering. And it wasn't something that my parents told me what it was. I was just a latchkey kid. My dad um, was a carpenter. He also was a photographer. My mom was a seamstress at one point. So I, I grew up around creatives. But they were from, my dad is from Honduras and my mom is from Guatemala. So what they taught me was really work ethic. What they taught me was if something is broke, you fix it. What they taught me was you always have to make something out of nothing. And so that's all I know. And so what I understood about education was, especially in New York City, was that you have to find the best schools that may not be in your district. 
So the best school for me was literally three blocks away, but it was in another district. So technically, I wasn't supposed to go to that school. My parents had to get very creative and find someone who lived across the street so that they can get a lease just to sign me up. That changed the trajectory of my life because there were teachers in that school who believed in me, who gave me the access, who allowed me to know that I could be much more. And the first thing my mother said to me is, I don't want you to be me. I don't want you to have to be a second-class citizen. I don't want you to have to take orders. I want you to be able to give them. So with that said, the teachers that I had liberated my mind. They gave me the technology. They gave me the tools that I needed. And they allowed me to see how STEM was just part of everyday living. But in this day and age, kids don't seem to understand that. They're tech savvy, quote unquote, with Instagram and Snapchat. And they're the consumers, but they're not the producers. So what I had to do is say to my scholars, I'm going to teach you the fundamentals of what it means to be a creator, not just a consumer. And of course, they did not understand that. Of course, they rebelled. Of course, their parents felt like, I'm going to trust you, but I'm not going to show up. And that's the life of a principal, especially in Brownsville. I have 200 scholars now. I started the school with only seven the first day the school opened. By the end of the day, we had 14 scholars. By the end of the month, we had 24. By the end of the year, we only had 39 scholars. By the following year, people said, this woman is crazy. She really believes in these kids. We tripled our numbers. By the third year, we had 240 scholars in our building, all because I was willing to take them to the places that they belonged. Now, what does this have to do with STEM? Well, simple. I was willing to take my scholars out of the community that they lived in, not by telling them it wasn't good enough, because as you can see with my shirt that I have on, we've coined the term Brownsville brilliance. They can't have an imagination if they can't see beyond the limitations of their community. So we literally would take them outside. We would partner with organizations. We would partner with people. We would ask people to come into the school because we wanted them to understand that if you just step into the place or give children the opportunity to see what the possibilities are, you can change the landscape of their future. Don't they deserve that? And so our scholars had that opportunity. We took them to college, even though there were so many colleges who said to me, do you really think that they're ready? I said, that's quite interesting. Would you say that to your own child? So of course, those are not the schools that my scholars who are now in college could ever apply to, right? But the ones who did say yes, we did show up there. We showed up to the ones that were willing to show our scholars classrooms, not the gymnasium, not the cafeteria, because somehow they thought that that would be the place that kids were supposed to be excited. And my scholars would come back and say, you know, they showed us the gymnasium, but they didn't show us the lab. Interesting. So what we would do in the school is we basically created project-based learning. And that was really, really important because my scholars come in on a first, second, and third grade level. Yet I'm supposed to get them prepared for high school. I'm supposed to make them the most competitive global citizen in the world, yet we have failed them for the first five years, the critical years of their lives. But we do it because guess what? Children are human. It is innate for them to be curious, but we have to let them think about what they're going to do without holding on. Let them grapple. Let them figure it out. Let them break something and put it together. Let them understand that when I was a kid, I'm going to date myself. I had a Commodore 64. You could not turn on a Commodore 64 and it would just magically start working. You were doing MS-DOS. We were coding back then, right? Now it's like the kids put it on and if it's broke, the computer doesn't work. <sighs> Even the adults, is there a technician that we can call, right? So I wanted my scholars to understand that you can code, yes, but I want you to create your own company. So we teach them entrepreneurship as well. 
they have to all pass a course which is powered by NEFTI in their seventh grade year because at $11,000, if this is what they're going to be earning in their fam for their families, what do you think is going to happen? You can't survive off of that. And I can't have you out there becoming a criminal. So I want you to create, I want you to own, I want you to invest, and I want you to stay in your community, and I want you to build your community, and I want you to know that you are significant and great. But there are soft skills that you need to know in order to navigate through this revolution that we're going through into the fourth industrial revolution. Remain creative. Keep thinking. Never stop that. Don't let the passion fizzle out. Communicate. Open up your mouths. Present. Even if you're the minority in the group, you have a right to be in that room. You have a right to be at the table. And when they don't invite you, make your own. You have a right to sit and collaborate with others and share ideas. Because guess what? If you don't say anything, they're going to think that you're less intelligent. And you're not. My kids go to Harvard every single year. We have a partnership with them. Everyone is always so impressed by them. Because you know what? They actually take over the conversations. My kids learned about, they learn so much about art. They're so creative. They love science. They were having a conversation with the astrophysicist, Dr. John Johnson, and I shared this with Graham earlier. Um, he was the first tenured teacher, African-American at Harvard. He had a presentation. It was amazing. He could not get through it. The kids kept interrupting him. He was like, okay, kids, but I do have a presentation. And they were like, but I have another question. And he was like, okay. He went to the last slide. He said, okay, thank you. Now let me have a conversation with you. For an entire hour, he was captivated by their minds. Even my teachers were so surprised. And I said, why would you think anything less of them? So what I say to you is this. It doesn't matter where children are. It doesn't matter what their zip codes are. They need access. They need opportunity. They need investment. They need people to believe in them. They need people to just show up. And they will tell you what they need. And you will be just as impressed. So I started out by telling you my at, which is the Lopez Effect. I told you about Mount Hall Bridges Academy. You can Google it. I do invite you, though, to actually come and see the school. Let my kids wow you. They love people coming to meet with them. But the only way that we can end the generational genocide that exists in communities like Brownsville and around the world is by saying that it's not about the have and the have nots. If we're going to collaborate, if we're going to engage in humanity, and we're going to really change this world and be transformative, we have to do it as a collective. Because in this day and age, it shouldn't be about color. It should just be about everyone sharing the same idea, which is for all of us to be successful. Can we agree to that? All right, excellent. So I'm going to pass it, because I don't want to take too long, to Chris Regini, who's going to share.